Hi everyone, this is Charlize from Forward Chess and today we're going to be continuing our opening series and taking a look at the Karuk Khan. So first off, I know that there is this conception that the Karakon is you know, boring opening, it's slow, not much is happening. I've heard it all before, I play it myself. But there are some really interesting lines and it is very solid, uh, but black can really gain an attack out of nowhere sometimes. And it's just overall pretty easy to play if you understand it. Now, the moves are characterized, the starting moves are characterized by e4, c6. This is the Karakan and this is what we're going to take a look at today. Now, a few things uh, to just talk about in this video. We are using the Forward Chess book app and we're going to look at all the little features you can use. You can highlight, you can draw arrows, we can even highlight text. The book we're working from is from Yvanka Huska's uh, Karakan opening repertoire. An amazing book that covers almost everything, basically everything for black. Um, and this is what the board will look like when you read a book on forward chess, you go through the moves and it comes up on the board next to you. We also have engine analysis available and um, yeah, so let's get into it. So first of all, let's talk about the, the history of the Karakan. Now, the Karakan is named after two players, um, Marcus Khan and Horatio Karu. They analyzes opening in the 19th century you can find a couple of games from them uh, online and see how the theory has developed since then we're going to take a look at some main lines and just understand what the Karakon is all about we have the main starting position here and after c6 white decides to take control of the center since black is allowing that by playing d4 of course, we learn this uh, when we start out in chess. If your opponent doesn't put a pawn in the center, you put two pawns in the center. This is just to gain more control, open up space. As you can see, white's bishops are open, white can develop freely. But black is not just going to give the center to white. Black is going to claim it back with a move like d5. And this is our normal uh, Karakan position. Black challenges white center. Now from this position, we have a few different lines that we're going to look at. First of all, we've got the classical and two knights variation. This is where white plays knight c3 or even plays knight d2. This leads to the same thing. White is defending this e pawn. We have uh, the exchange variation where white captures on d5, immediately clarifying the center. And then finally, we're also going to look at the advanced variation, which is e5. So let's start with the classical variation. With knight c3 or knight d2, either will lead to the same position because here black captures the pawn. After white captures, there are two main moves. In her book, Yavanka goes through bishop f5. Now, bishop f5 is one of the main lines. Of course, uh, black develops the bishop, attacks the knight, prepares for e6 to come. White plays knight g3, and we come back bishop g6. So this is the main position. White develops the knight to either f3 or to e2 to come to f4. And you can have a look at all this theory, but what we're going to focus on is the Tartakawa line. Now that comes from this position. Instead of playing bishop f5, black plays knight f6. Now knight f6 challenging white's knight. This line has been popular. It's been around for a while, but lately it's gaining more traction. Now the idea is that white, black is asking white, what do you want to do with this knight? Do you want to retreat or do you want to capture my knight and give me double pawns? Now let's take a look at the most played, which is capturing on f6. Here there are two responses. Of course, you can see black has two pawns to capture with. And even though it might seem obvious to capture with the e pawn to open up the, the black squared bishop, black can also capture with the g pawn, which is called the Bronstein larsen variation. You could take a look at this line, uh, but we'll focus on e takes. This is called the Tartakawa 
variation black voluntarily gets double pawns and okay this might seem bad you know this is how we're taught getting double pawns isn't always the best thing but you have to remember that double pawns aren't always bad in this case we get a let's use our arrows we get a nice open file which our black rook will get to and these two pawns provide a bit of a safety net for the black king You'll see in a lot of positions, uh, black also ends up pushing this pawn and using it in the kingside attack. From this position, we can talk about what happens. Black will develop quickly with bishop d6, castle, and rook e8. This is the main setup that will happen. Queen c7 will also come in. And a nice little idea to remember is this knight coming to f8. So let's look at a few moves and see what's happening. White will play c3, just reinforcing this nice pawn chain, solidifying the d4 pawn. We continue with our development, bishop d6. Of course, there are a lot of different moves here, but I'm just going to show you a typical line that happens. Bishop d3, black castles as soon as possible. Now we've got queen c2 as a main line. Note that the white knight doesn't develop just yet, as we'll see why, but also if the knight ever comes to f3, you've got to take into consideration that the bishop can come to g4 and that pin becomes a little bit annoying. So white prefers to bring the knight to e2. After queen c2, rook e8, going for that check, taking the open file, white blocks with knight e2. Right, so after knight e2, we got our check, but at the same time, we can see that this queen and bishop are staring down at our h7 pawn. So black has two main ideas here. You can either push the pawn to h6 or h5. Both are completely fine. I prefer h5. It's a little bit more aggressive and it also stops um, the knight from coming to g3 because then h4 is pushed and a lot of theory happens. But let's check uh, h6, let's say white castles, queen, c7. And now uh, this is a very typical position in this line. Now we're looking at this h2 pawn, of course, white can block, white can push the pawn. But an idea I want you to remember here to defend on the king side is always this knight coming to f8. This is always a nice idea uh, for black to remember. Right, now let's go back to our starting position. Now let's take a look at another variation. Instead of knight f6 or bishop f5, as we saw, black also has the move knight d7. This is called the modern or Karpov variation. Um, and the idea is that black wants to develop this g knight to f6 and trade knights recapturing with the d7 knight. Now, common plans for white are also to develop. Let's change arrows. Let's give white a blue arrow. The knight comes to f3, the bishop comes to d3. This e knight chooses to either capture on f6 or retreat to g3. And white castles kingside. A pretty uh, standard setup for white and black on the other hand also just tries to develop let's go back to our green arrow after knight f6 black can choose to develop this dark squared bishop via the via e6 or via g6 and that's a wrap for our knight c3 knight d2 variation these are again this is a brief look at all of these lines of course there's a lot more that black and white can do there's a lot of theory involved but you can get some kind of idea of what it's like to play for black let's take a look at our other options for white as we said we've got the advance and we've got the exchange variation the exchange variation as the name suggests uh, similar to in the french if white decides to trade this pawn we call that exchange let's take a look at what this variation entails so white captures on d5 black captures back as well clarifying the center of course not with the queen we want a pawn to be in the center to challenge white's pawn in the center 
And here there are two main ways for white to respond. White can either go for the main line, which is bishop d3. The idea of bishop d3 mostly is to stop black from playing bishop f5, which pretty much is the ideal square for our light squared bishop in Karakhan positions. You will see this in a lot of um, different lines. But black has a typical Karlsbad's pawn structure. So we have a majority pawns on the king side, these two pawns on the queen side, and white has the opposite. But we also have a semi-open file, which we can bring a rook to, and we have a potential minority attack in the end game, pushing these two points. The typical methods of development for a black here are to bring the queen to c7, similar to how white brought the bishop to d3 to stop bishop f5. We are bringing the queen to c7 to stop the white bishop coming to f4. We play knight c6, knight f6, develop your light squared bishop uh, to either g4. Or there are some crazy ways to play where you can play g6 and bring your bishop to f5. Hoping for a trade of bishops so that your g file is nice and open. At the same time, g6 is also a typical idea if you want to bring your bishop to g7. Right, let's go back after trading bishop d3, the main line, which you can take a look at. I want to also talk about c4, the Panoff but Vinic attack. Now, if you look at the exchange variation, and I guess in most openings, this is more of the, you know, calmer <laughs> route to take in an opening. Uh, you avoid a lot of theory. But then enters the c4 move. This is called the Panoff but Vinic. Now, the idea is that white, once again, is challenging black center, but white is also voluntarily giving themselves an IQP. Now black will capture and this is the position that we will get. White wants to have a lot of activity uh, using the IQP for the space advantage. Black of course will seek to exchange pieces as this is the, the way to play in IQP positions. You want to trade pieces so that this pawn becomes weak in the end game. Now, going back to our main position and our final look will be at the advanced variation. Now, as the name suggests, white doesn't capture the pawn, white doesn't defend the pawn. Instead, white advances the pawn to e5. From this position, black has two main options. The first is to break down white's pawn structure by playing c5. And this is a typical idea to remember when you're attacking a pawn chain, you want to attack the base of the pawn chain. Because once this is captured, once that pawn chain is broken up, you've got two weak pawns instead of two strong pawns defending each other. The second idea here for black is to play bishop f5. Now, bishop f5 has a lot of theory and it can get pretty aggressive. You've got lines where white plays g4, You've got lines of h4. Basically, white likes to push a pawn storm on the king side with these h and g pawns. Becomes a little scary, but remember, black always has h5, h6 to open up space for this bishop. Right, uh, let's look at an idea here. Black, on the other hand, looks for counterplay on the queen side by bringing the queen to c7, by pushing, or b6, by pushing c5. Basically, playing on these pawns, but first getting this bishop out. There is still a lot of theory developing in these types of positions, and um, it can get quite aggressive, but at the same time, it can also be pretty solid for both sides. The second idea here, after e5, instead of bishop f5, black also has c5. Now, as we mentioned, this is immediately going to break up that pawn structure. Uh, and the sidesteps a whole lot of theory. There are a few main moves you need to look at from white side. The first, of course, what happens if white captures on c5. Now, this is the most straightforward. And black follows this up with a move like 
e6, defending the d5 pawn, creating a nice pawn chain here, but also opening up this bishop to capture on c5. White can, of course, hold onto the pawn, or at least try to hold onto the pawn with a move like b4. But as we have spoken about in previous videos as well, typical idea of um, attacking such a pawn structure is going for a5. Another way that white defends is via bishop e3, but uh, black will keep putting pressure on this pawn. And a nice idea to remember here is also to bring the knight from e5 to f5, attacking that e3 bishop. Basically, black will get this pawn back, but also remember that the e pawn is weak as well. So your knight can come to c6, attacking this pawn, and white's going to struggle to hold on to both of them. Next up, we've got the move by white, that is c3. Now c3 supporting the d4 pawn, and this might look super familiar because it kind of looks like French defense structures. But in this case, the light squared bishop for black is open, as e6 hasn't been committed yet. Though we can have similar plans, bringing the knight to c6, bringing the queen to b6. There is a lot of different ways for black to play here. Finally, we've got a move after c5, we've got knight f3. Now knight f3, white just develops to support the d pawn. Black captures and as you can see, this e pawn is not the um, not the strongest pawn in the world and can be a, become a target in future. And that's it for our overview on the Karakan. On the blog, you can check out a few games, a few model games we have linked in, uh, including one by the creator himself or one of the creators, Horatio Caro. You can also check out a few books if you want to actually delve into this opening, understand it better. We have a few options on forward chess. You can just type in Karakan in the search bar and you'll see we have a few options that come back on playing the Karakan and also playing against the Karakan, whichever you prefer. Until next time, bye!